Hey, what's up you amazing hackers? I hope you're all doing well today. So, I get the feeling that a lot of you know what Burp Suite is, but also a lot of you don't really know what it has to offer. Burp Suite is such an amazing tool and it has so much to offer, which I'm going to show you today. Now, I'm going to be looking to my left real quick, because there I have what I think is my Burp Suite guide. These are my pro tips for you guys, and I hope they will help you in your journey. So let's get started, shall we? First of all, we need the chapter, what is Burp Suite Pro? Do I really need it? Because I've been asked this question a lot, Uncle Red. Do I really need to get Burp Suite Pro, or is the Community Edition fine? Well, in my opinion, the Community Edition is fine. You don't need it in the sense that you don't really need to eat French fries. You don't really need to have super nice clothes. You just need to have clothes. You need to have food. You need to have the Burp Community Edition to hack a little bit, in my opinion. But the Burp Suite Pro Edition is so much better and it offers so much extra features for you guys. There are some general advantages that everybody can take advantage of. And that's of course going to be very important in this matter um, because there are some more business to business advantages as well which we'll get into later but first the general advantages the biggest advantage for me is that i can save my project this is very very important for me because i am a full-time dad i have a job so for me, hunting is not something that I get to do for hours and hours and hours on end like I used to before. I usually get to attack my target for one to two hours at a time. And when I do that, I have to make sure that I don't have to set up my target's attack strategy, that I don't have to set up my whole infrastructure for attacking every single time. That setup costs me time, especially for me, as you'll guys see on later on as well. There are some things that I always do when I start up Burp Suite, and those things are very important to me. Every single project has them, and I really cannot compromise on those. So setting that up takes a while. It takes 5, 10, 15 minutes even, and I really don't want to spend that time every single time just setting up my project. So. That's really important for me that I can save my project, not just for my target tab, for my um, scope, but also for some other settings, which we'll get into later on. Um, there are some other advantages as well. For example, the intruder can be used at full speed. That's important. Um, if you have to use the intruder at the at the throttled speed and at the throttled amount of requests, it's going to be a lot harder to find the good vulnerabilities. Um, so you can only make up to a hundred uh, requests per attack apparently in the community edition. That's not a lot. Uh, and the severity of the rate limiting is also very important. So if you get the pro version, that's going to help you out there. And what's also really cool is that there are some really good word lists built into the intruder by Port Twigger and that are only available in the pro version as well. Those are some really decent work lists and I use them quite a lot. I have my own, of course, as well. Content discovery, guys, it's an amazing tool that you only get in the pro version. Content discovery is like directory brute forcing on steroids. It's a great tool. It has an amazing worked in a built list work built in work list. So definitely worth it in my opinion. Um, besides that, there's also access to a host of other useful engagement tools. So we'll look at some more of those later. Uh, and we can search our whole project. If we click the burp thing here, we have a search option. This is not available in the community edition either. This is super useful, guys. Really, really useful. Um, and besides that, there's also the burp collaborator client. Um, you have Burp Collaborator and Infiltrator clients. Those are very useful that you have your own, that you don't need to share them with other people because in um, the Community Edition, you also have access to the Burp Collaborator client, of course, but you need to have the public version. Um, there is no private version in the Community Edition, which makes it worthwhile, in my opinion, to have. But I really want you to look at these things and ask yourself, do I need them? Do I really need these things to make my experience good? 
if you really need them, then maybe that $400 or something, I don't know how much it is per year, but that amount might not be that much money, especially if you find one or two bounties with the extra functionalities that you have. Um, there's also other things like a host of cool extensions. I've made a separate chapter on that, which we'll get into later on as well. Now for small businesses, suppose you own a small business. Uh, you might want to uh, get these automated scans as well. For bug bounty hunters, it's going to be a lot less relatable in my opinion. Because a lot of targets, they say no automatic scanning is allowed. So that falls out of the boat. Um, also, as a bug bounty hunter, I don't think these automatic scans return as useful of vulnerabilities as they will in a pen testing scenario. That is because in a pen testing scenario, you'd be the first to a target. We are often the very last people to attack a target. So that means that we have to find some more hidden vulnerabilities. And those are often more easy to miss by a scanner in my opinion. That's why I say that these scanner results, they might not be as important uh, on other things. Now you do get some really cool information here. You might get some things like vulnerable jQuery version detected, but I found that usually it's very hard to actually find something to abuse this because for example, this specific CVE talks about regular expressions in jQuery.html pre-filter. They have to use that specific function before we can actually do any cross-site scripting. So it's not always easy to execute. Now, suppose you have some CI CD progress processes set up that you have an automatic pipeline to which you deploy your your production application to which you, you deploy your testing application. You might want to have Burp do those automatic scans in your CI CD pipeline. That's not in the professional edition. There's another edition called a, let me see real quick, an enterprise edition. I have to put it right. And that's going to have that CI CD integration plus a whole range of other options I'm not going to get into today. That's a little bit outside of the scope of this specific course, in my opinion. Um, onto the Burp Suite dashboard. This has a lot of useful functions and that's what you've been staring at the whole time as well. You can see here, first of all, that my text task execution is paused. If you have Burp Suite Pro and you have these tasks running or even the community edition, it's always going to do that if you have that option enabled. So I'm going to resume my scanning tasks. If you don't see your site map filling up in here, that's going to be because your tasks are not capturing. They might be off like this or they might be paused. Um, let's see if I can, no, I cannot. You can also click here, of course. So if it's on this, that's also paused. That's also something you have to look at. So there's a lot of things you have to check, of course, very important. So um, after starting up, this is what we see. Um, the first thing that I always look at is my event log. If I have failures, if I am not capturing my traffic properly, if there's something going wrong, it's probably going to be described in here what's going wrong, like proxy service could not start or authentication failures. There might be many different things that happen and they can all come into the event log. Also, if you write a custom extension, you might be able to write events yourself. So that might also be found in here. Um, now for the scans part in here, we have a few different types of scans. We have a crawling type of scan. We have a crawl and audit and we have an audit selected items. The audit selected items is only available from different context menus, which we'll get into later. But for now, we can click the new scan button. And in here, we see the crawl and audit and the crawl functionality. Now, there is a difference between those two. Crawling a website allows Burp to automatically scan it. It's going to go through the whole website, collect anything that looks like a URL, try to surf to it and add it to the list. Simple as that. It's going to try to click on every single URL that it sees. And then the auditing part, of course, is very, very simple. Um, for auditing itself, it's just trying to look at your at what it gathered at all of those web pages. And you can have your passive audits and have, you can have your active audits, also known as static 
or dynamic uh, and the difference between those two is that a static one is not going to execute any code if you do a static audit it's just going to look at all of the data that's on there um, and it's going to try and see if there are any vulnerabilities pro programmed into that specific website, into that specific JavaScript file, whatever it may be. It's going to look for vulnerabilities in there based on some expressions. Um, and then you can also just crawl, of course. You can enter your URLs that you want to crawl in here and you can scan your different protocols. That's all very simple. I don't need to cover too much of that. I think people will know this stuff. Um, what's really interesting though is your scan configurations and you have your crawl and audit and your crawl and by default your scan is going to run uh, and it's going to run pretty obtrusively in my opinion. So what you can do is add a scan configuration and you can add one or multiple scan, scan configurations in here or you can add your own. Um, now if we select from library we see that there are quite a few built in already. In here we can do things like for example we can say we don't want JavaScript analysis because that can take a long time so we can select that option and then bam it's suddenly going to skip all of the JavaScript files. We can say that we want a really heavy scan as well so audit coverage thorough or even audit coverage maximum. We can add both, but it's going to take the highest one, of course, and these rules are kind of conflicting, so try not to add those. That might give you some conflicting things in your results as well. Um, so we can add quite a lot of them in here. We can add a lot of these built-in ones, or we can add some of our own. And in there, we have some crawling and auditing options, as you can see, which is the same thing in here. We have auditing options and crawling strategies. Um, we can do the same thing, we can add a, cr a crawling strategy and if we want to enable any one of these options, for example crawl optimizations, we have to click it open and now this is going to be enabled. So we can say we want an optimization station of a link def of 5 max for example and then we can see in here that we have those options set and we have a crawl strategy that's being set which we can also put to custom but we're not going to do that but as you can see you can customize this very 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 deeply and then we can save that to our library as well which means that we can reuse that later on we can now select that one from our library as you guys can see here going to delete it again. We can also import stuff in here. We can move things up or down in this list. The order really matters, the order that you put things in, uh, especially if you have conflicting things, it's going to really matter which order they are in. It might also just help for you to sort things out a little bit better. You can put things up or down uh, to put them together. Now you can also import a lot of these, we're not going to do that right now because I don't have any configuration files ready. Um, but that's about it for the scan configurations. So then we can also give it some credentials which it can use to log in. This is possible um, and Burp will try to look for those specific uh, login forms and it will enter those credentials. Now you can of course again save them to library, so if I have label test 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 there we go i can save that to library with a configuration name of test and then i can select those credentials from my library again so really useful i can either use login credentials or i can use the recorded login sequences uh, but i do need burps chrome extension for that that's pretty new um, and this is also pretty uh, restrictive, so I would use this one for now, but I would certainly explore it for sure. Then you, of course, have your resource pool as well. Here we need to select how many concurrent requests we want to make, if we want to have a delay between those requests, how many of those resources we have available, etc. And we can either select an existing resource pool or we can create a new one. If we create a new resource pool, it's going to be available in our project, of course. Um, so that's about it for the scans. We pick which type of scan we want to do. We pick how thoroughly we want it. We pick some options. We set the login. We pick which resource pool we want for it. 
and then we go then we just run of course we need to define some urls to scan as well otherwise it will not run um, but then it's going to open a new window in your scan tasks so that's all pretty basic there are some cool things in there like saving to library but i think we've covered most of the basics there you also have live tasks and that is live scanning which means that every single time a request is going to come in into one of these specific tools the proxy the repeater or the intruder it's going to do a live audit either a predefined task from this list or a live passive crawl whichever you pick the url scope can be everything suit scope or custom scope of course and you can also ignore duplicate items sometimes for example you make 500 requests to a logging server well we don't want to keep making those requests of course so we can deduplicate them and that's going to remove them from our task list uh, we can also again pick the same scan configurations they're going to be a little bit different here because of course live scanning has a different principle it's not going to do any scanning itself you're going to have to feed it the requests uh, so the principle is a little bit different you cannot set up as much in here um, but you can specify certain things in here again save to library is an option here um, we can have a resource pool and that is about it for this so then we have our live tasks ready no we're not going to update right now mister thank you very much um, there's also the issue activities which you can see up here which we already looked at a little bit you can see specifically your issue types i haven't found anything useful in here if you guys have please tell me because i haven't found anything useful in here this is not stuff that for me is useful if it is it's going to be at least a high severity but for a pen tester that's going to differ quite a lot of course now that was it for this part we're going to move over to the next section real quick uh, that is going to cover the target tab and in the target tab we have several useful options as well um, in here we this in my opinion is one of the most useful tabs that you have we're going to start with this sitemap in here. Now this sitemap, we saw these tasks in here. This live passive crawl from proxy all traffic. This is the one that's going to fill up your sitemap. So when you're browsing, you're going to get a proxy, you're going to get traffic in here and your sitemap is going to be filled up by this specific task. If you have it off, it's not going to fill your sitemap up. So that's going to be a problem if you don't see anything in here it might be either your scope is being set incorrectly or that the task is just not running that's happened to me before now if the task is paused don't worry those executions those requests are not going to get lost as soon as you unpause the task it's going to add them, add them to the sitemap in here um, real quick for the filtering this has some really cool stuff in here. You've probably seen this before. You can show only your parameterized requests. This is something really useful. This is what I care about. I don't care about static requests. This is what I usually follow up on because I'm an API hacker. I love doing API requests. And those are usually going to be parameterized if I can make any impact on them. Now I can also filter by mind type, for example, if I only want to see JavaScript, that's possible. I can just select scripts in here. If I only want to see HTML files, if I only want to see XML files, etc. You guys know the drill, you can select whatever you want in here. Now by default, if you get a 403, for example, it's not going to show up in your sitemap. That's because the 4xxx request errors are not being shown by default. If you want to see them, you'll have to enable them. Don't worry, they're not gone, but this is done because 404 is also a 4xx status code and 404 means not found. So you're going to possibly have a lot of those in there, especially if you've been running some tools against your target and it's been returning a lot of 404s. Now the hide empty folders, this can, is enabled by default, which is pretty good of course. And then you can filter by search term here. You can enter any term that you want. You can, it's going to look everywhere in this sitemap in the bodies and the headers. It's going to look in the request itself and everywhere in there. 
Um, and then you can do that with a regular expression. You can do it case sensitive or insensitive. And if you enable negative search, it's going to remove everything that has this search term in it. Filter by file extension has some cool options as well. You can show only or hide all of specific files. Um, if you want to find all of the JavaScript files, really easy to do. There we go, I found all of the JavaScript files. Um, there are some other cool tricks you can do with this, of course. And then you can filter by annotation, which you can show only the commented items or show only the highlighted items for. And this is really cool because if you click on a request for, oh wow, I've removed quite a lot of them now, apparently let's remove my, there we go. So if we right click on this request, for example, we have the scan option. We can do that to one request. We can do that to a complete um, host in here. We can do it to a specific subfolder. There are a lot of different things that we can actually scan. We can right click it. And if we do that, we have a new option in here, which is audit selected items. And as you can see here, it's going to list all of those specific items and it's going to create a new test for you. And then you can do again, add a specific scan configuration, select your resource pool, and then we can start the same scanning again. Again, only available in the pro version though. Um, that was it for filtering scanning. We've had those, then we'll move over to scope. This is a really cool section in here because you can use the advanced scope control or the regular one. I always use the advanced one. This has the advantage that I can enter regular expressions in here. I usually enter part of my host like in here, ferretshop.herokuabla.com. And if there are specific subdomains that are out of scope, you can add them to the exclude from scope section in here. HackerOne has some really useful things that you can do to export that configuration file for Burp for their whole scope and all of that stuff. So you can definitely check that out. It's going to be in the PDF that's also in the course. Um, as for the issue definitions, this is not going to be as useful. This is just a list of all of the specific issues that can happen with Burp Suite. Now we move over to the proxy tab and this is also a really cool option here. I spent most of my time, I would say, um, here we have again the same filter options. So you can show only in scope items, hide items without responses, show only parameterized requests, really useful request type filters if you ask me. You can see that one thing has gone from here, which is the filter by empty folders. That's because there are no folders in the HTTP history, of course. Um, and then we also have an extra option here, filter by listener. And that's because we can have multiple proxy listeners, of course, and they are all going to be listening on different ports and we can filter on those specific ports as well. Now, one thing I forgot to mention is you can see the show only commented items and show only high highlighted items in here. If we have a specific response that we want to look at later on, we can highlight that. We can right click that resp response and then we have an option for highlighting a response in a specific color. Now, if we do that, then we can filter on those specific responses. We can group specific responses if we want to, like we can color all of these in red. Um, and I want to color all of these in a different color because they might be from a different user or something like that. And we can also add a comment to a specific URL like this test. And then if we do that, it's going to add that to the list here. Now we can filter on those, but we can also, of course, put the comments on top. And then we have that list as well. I usually filter by putting my le my latest one up here. Um, that's going to make sure that I don't have to keep scrolling down, down, down. I just filter with the latest number at the top. And then again, you can also highlight by just clicking the number and it's going to highlight the whole row for you. So those are some tricks for the intercept for the HTTP history. Um, here we have the request, we have a response, very simple stuff. We can right click that, we can do things in here, um, but we'll get more into those context menus later. Now for the intercept tab, by default, Burp is going to start with intercept on. If you're surfing to a website, but nothing is loading, check if intercept is on. That's happened to me way more than I like to admit, so check if it's on, that's going to help you a lot. 
Then of course Burp also has a built-in browser which you can use, which I almost never use because again, I want to save time and I have my passwords saved in my browser's password manager. What this is going to do is start a completely new session. So you're going to lose all of those passwords every, day, every single time. I just used Firefox for that, by the way. Um, then we also have the WebSocket history and this is pretty cool. Uh, WebSocket is pretty much an advanced HTTP protocol. You can see it is that. Now I know that I'm butchering it. Please don't, don't kill me for that. Um, but we can also send this stuff to repeat or do the same things in here. We also have a filter in here, which we again can filter by port listener. But we don't have a lot of the stuff here like you can see in here. We cannot filter by search term. We cannot filter by file extension because that's just not applicable. Uh, it's going to be a lot harder to, oh, sorry, we can filter by search term. We're missing this MIME type option. And that's because MIME types, of course, are not applicable to WebSockets. Now, what a WebSocket is going to do is make a connection to the client or to the server, and it's going to exchange messages that way. Um, we used to not have this option in the burp when I started. It was all make your own WebSocket stuff, but now I'm really, really glad that we do have it in here. It's going to make our lives a lot easier. Um, for the proxy options, this is something that is going to be really cool. This is my favorite part of Burp because it has some really cool options in here. Again, you can add, edit or remove certain, certain listeners. Now, why would you want to do that? You might be asking. Imagine this scenario. So you're testing and you're testing with real devices. Um, maybe you're testing with five mobile applications, like you're testing with five mobile phones and all of those different phones, you can set them to a different listener and then you can capture all of their traffic on that different listener. If you then later on need to filter for one specific phone, you can filter for one specific listener. You have many scenarios that I can think of which multiple listeners would be useful for. So definitely try it out and see if you can find some scenarios for yourself. You also have the import export CA certificate and regenerate CA certificate. Those are needed for capturing your traffic and being able to read it. So you need this certificate um, for your man in the middle proxy. And then you have the intercept and the client, the intercept client request. Sorry about that. This one is not as interesting for me. This one I don't use as much, so I'm going to skip it as well. The intercept service response, server responses, same thing. Uh, if you really want to, and you don't want to capture specific requests, like for example, if you don't want to get put requests, you can say I want to does not match the put request in here. So. I can edit this one, not add a new one. I can say HTTP method does not match get post or put, or I can just keep it at put. I can just make it get. Uh, I can add several rules in here, which are going to add to allow me to remove certain requests from my proxy. Can be very useful. For example, like you see in here, we have these polling calls in here. Say I don't want to capture them. Then I can say a new rule and the body does not, let's see, body does not match. And then I can say star, like I can say specific things in here. So that's useful in some scenarios. It's not as useful for me. Uh, for me, it becomes very useful at this response modification section. This is where the most important things are for me because I usually try to unhide hidden form fields and I prominently online, uh, highlight them. That's going to draw a big red square around your form field and it's going to be very useful in my opinion because hidden form fields, they're hidden for a reason. Then you can enable those disabled form fields as well. Sometimes you just want to type in a form field but it's disabled, you have to go into inspect element. You have to remove that disabled thingy. It's really annoying. I don't care about any front end protection that's client aimed like this. Um, I do care about the JavaScript and object tags. I do care about the HTTP thingy. I do care about that secure flag. Those things are not things that I am going to be able to manipulate as an attacker to gain an advantage really easily. But these things I am able to manipulate really easily like the input field length limits. That's something that's really annoying. Sometimes if 
length limit is just front end and your API isn't going to care if you send it one character or a million characters. So I just remove all of that front end stuff and also any JavaScript form validation that is available. Um, it's useful of course to have and it's useful to be there, but it's not going to protect the web server. The web server needs to be protected at a web server level. It's as simple as that. Now for your match and replace, there's some seriously cool things we can do with this. Match and replace in here, we can do things like test for CSRF. If we want to test CSRF tokens, we can replace them from the body automatically, like say this. So for example, CSRF equals, got it typed right, of course, CSRF equals star. If we want to replace every single CSRF token with a one, we can automatically do that from the request body. There we go. If you're now clicking around on the website, we're automatically testing for CSRF. There's IDORs that you can test with this. There's even cross-site scripting, like replacing every input that you have. Like if you have one specific input factor, for example, my input factor for cross-site scripting might be this. Um, I might always for cross-site scripting have an image source equal X on error. Uh, equals alert and then I might add in some other things as well uh, like for example a single um, a double one uh, and then maybe some like this to get I don't know just test everything at once you know um, but I don't want to type this every time and I don't want to keep this in my clipboard either because there are other things that I have to paste in my clipboard as well I can say for example match everywhere that I type five times A and replace it with my attack factor. That way, if I am testing, of course, I have to sometimes do regex match, not in this case, I think, because it's a little replacement and I need to do that in the request body. There we go. Now, every time that I type five A's and I've sent my re request in, uh, it's going to replace that with my attack factor and I don't have to worry about it anymore. It's going to be very quick for me. Uh, I love doing stuff like this. It, it saves me a couple of nanoseconds, but all of those nanoseconds add up. The rest of those I don't really touch. I leave them alone. You can add a TLS pass through. You can do some of this miscellaneous stuff, but that's not really important in my opinion. Then we move on to the intruder. The intruder is a really cool part about Burp Suite. Say for example that we're testing a request and we can do this from the HTTP history, we can do this from the target sitemap, it doesn't really matter, but we can right click that and then send that request to our intruder. Now what that's going to do is it's going to fill in the host and the port for us and it's also going to add in these positions. By default it's always going to uh, it's always going to mark every single parameter including the cookies. So to avoid that, what I just do is I clear all of them and say that I've clicked this button by mistake. Oh crap, I am a hacker, but I clicked this button by mistake. What do I do now? I don't want to select all of them. You can just click auto again and it's going to automatically assign those, but you have to select your whole text. Now what you can also do is clear, say for example, you want to automatically select these parameters only, then you can select this whole header part here there we go you can automatically assign them again and it's going to look for parameters in your selected um, in your selected text and it's automatically going to mark that parameter now we need to mark parameters because what we really want to do is we want to of course test uh, we want to test several parameters we want to replace their values automatically and we want to do that rapidly so to do that we need to select a parameter like this one for example add it to our parameter list and then we have several options for our attack types uh, and this is where things get really interesting because we have this sniper attack type battering ram pitchfork and a cluster bomb all of those have different uh, different properties to them uh, we're going to go all over all of them real quick but I'm searching for them uh, there we go so this sniper thing what it's going to do is it's going to replace a single value into every single parameter which means that if I, if I have one single value selected like this it's going to replace my list that I select under the payloads which I'll select later on but it's going to add a this specific parameter now if I have two parameters it's going to try that value for all of those parameters so that's going to 
add up pretty quickly as you guys can see if I have about 10 parameters it's going to try it every single value into every single parameter that's going to be a lot of combinations that it has to go through and it grows exponentially we don't always want that that's why we also have some other options like the battering RAM and what this is going to do is it's going to use one list but will insert that payload into every single position so if it's going to have A, B, C and D on its list, it's going to insert A in here and also in here and then send that request off and then B in here and in here, send that request off. It's going to insert C in here and send that request off and so on. So that's what the battering RAM is for. It can be useful to reduce your combination, but sometimes we want to control those combinations ourselves. That's why we have the pitchforks in here that's also a possibility and as you can see we have payload sets in here as well we have one and two now which is because we selected the pitchfork and this is going to allow us to select a separate list for every single parameter on its own and then we have the cluster bomb that also uses as much lists as there are parameters but that method will test every combination of all of the list items possible. So again, that attack is going to take a lot longer. We're talking about our cluster bomb here, whereas our pitchfork, as we call it, is just if we have two lists, like we have list one and two, uh, it's going to take one value from every list and it's going to insert it in here and then it's going to move on to the next value on the lists. That's the difference. So it might seem a little bit abstract, I encourage you guys to play with it a little bit because there are some cool things you can do in here. Um, now, next up is the payload section. I also wanted to show you guys, you can search by the way. This is really cool because you might have some pages which are really, really long. And you might be looking for that one parameter. Well, this is going to help you in here. Uh, you can search through it um, and you can also just refresh this. Um, that's about it. Now onto the payloads page in here, we can set our payloads. Of course, that sounds very logical um, in here. It really depends on what type of attack we set. In this case, we're going to have two payloads because it's a pitchfork attack. I'm going to keep it a little bit simpler, I'm going to go to the sniper and we only have one list as you can see right now. And then we can choose what type of list we want. This is really cool because there are some cool stuff in here if you want go look at this because I'm not going to go through all of them but you have brute forcers you have null payloads there's bit flippers in here there's some really cool stuff usually you're just going to use simple lists and you're going to define them yourselves the burp suite pro version has built-in lists as you can see here there's a fuzzing list quick fuzzing list full really good lists in here usernames passwords as well these are really useful, but as you can see, it's quite a lot of them. And if you have multiple parameters, you can see that the request count goes up pretty quickly. Um, we can clear that list again. We can then paste our own list from the clipboard. Also, if you have a list in your clipboard, you can just paste it in here. You can load your list, that's also possible. Then you can remove one item from the list. If we have this list, for example, and I don't want to test for this value, I can remove it and I can clear my whole list as well. I can add items manually also. I can just do this one by one, but that's going to be quite bothersome, of course. The payload processing rules are really, really cool. What this is basically going to allow you to do is going to allow you to process your payloads before they are being sent to the server. Things like URL encoding, for example, adding prefixes, suffixes, if you want to base64 encoded that's all possible as you can see so what's going to happen now is before my payload gets sent to the server it's first going to get base64 encoded and for the url encoding you can see that that's already a separate option so it's going to automatically url encode all of these options um, but you can do so much with this and there's also the option to invoke a burp extension which is going to be a separate course to writing your own burp extensions that you can invoke with this stuff really really cool for example you have, might have custom jwt tokens and then you have a payload list 
um, but you don't want to encode that payload list, then you can create a custom extension to encode your JWT token and then send it off to the server. So there are many different things that you can do in here. That's about it for the repeat, for the intruder. There are some options in here as well, but these are very much self-explanatory uh, in my opinion. The request engine is the most important one. If you want to slow down your attacks, you have to set down the number of threats to a lower number. You can also throttle them a little bit by setting a fixed or a variable um, delay between requests. And you can say when it's supposed to start. For example, if you want to do it delayed, if you want to do it paused, that's also possible. If you want to start your attack, but you want to just have it set up so somebody else can, can unpause it or something, that's all possible. Um, you have your attack results in here. There are some cool options, some grab matches. This is how it determines some specific things, like it will mark these things if it finds them. If you enable that option, by the way, you have to enable that. And then if it finds one of these values in the response, it's going to flag that response for you. A lot of people don't know that you can do that, but Intruder can automatically flag responses for you. You just have to add it. Um, then you also have an extraction that's possible. You can extract items specifically from responses. I haven't found a use for this yet, but I can see how it can be useful in certain scenarios, especially for pen testers. And you might need these values in other requests. Then we can grab specific payloads and we can do some redirections as well. So for example, if you have a site that's always giving you a 302, but then might redirect you to a correct site after you log in with correct credentials and might redirect you to log in if you don't then you might want to follow that redirection and that's also possible. You can say always follow redirection or only follow to on-site or in scope items. You can also process cookies and those redirections. That's it for intruder, quite a lot of things. One more little small useful thing, you might have 50 intruder tabs open and you don't know what they're doing anymore. If you double click on a tab in here, you can rename that tab and then we can see easily what they are doing. So really useful. You can also right click to close all the other tabs uh, or you can close a tab and right click it to reopen that tab. That's something not a lot of people know, but this is a very useful trick. Onto the repeater then. The repeater is also a very useful tool in our arsenal if you ask me. Um, what this is going to do is it's going to show us a couple of things. So we have the basics in here. A lot of you guys are going to know how to use the repeater. I'm not going to go too deep into it. You have your request, you have your response. One cool thing that I wanted to show you guys is that you can render your response. A lot of you will probably already know this, but you can also toggle between your history. Like if I send a few requests, I might make a few changes. There we go. Um, I can go back and forth between my requests and I also have a little bit of a history. I can right click my request and here are some more interesting options. I can save that entire history as a file and I can base at 64 encoder responses and the replies. Um, but I can also copy that specific URL. I can copy it as a curl command that can be useful if you're writing your report. You're always going to be asked what endpoint is this vulnerability on. Then you can just copy your URL from here. Um, you might want to copy the request as a, as a curl command. I usually don't do that. I provide steps to reproduce in the application itself. And you might want to copy it to a file, the specific request for later usage. Um, there are some other useful things you can do in here. This at the moment is a post request. I can change the request method to make it a get request. Can change it back. But of course my parameters are going to be lost in here. I can right click it and I can change the body encoding. This is going to make it a put request or it should make it a put request, but it doesn't in this case. Um, then we also have the paste from file. Then we can load a file that we saved previously. Um, now, if you do that, you do have to be mindful because there might be some authorization headers which might have expired. You might have to do the authorization call again and replace those authorization headers in requests that are a little bit older. If they have expired, then they have expired and you need to do that, of course. 
and you might say for example exploit explore a different endpoint for example if i don't want to use rest login but i want to use login 2 um, now i've been playing a little bit with this but this is not in my sitemap i can right click it and i can add this thing to my sitemap real easily so there we go i have a target now i should have this under west rest user and there it should be but it's not there um that's not good but i'll check into that later um on to the next part because that's about it for the repeater this is all very basic stuff you guys probably know all of this you can also rename your tabs again as you can see in here by just double clicking on that number and then you can start renaming your tab you can also reopen closed tabs that's also a possibility um, and you can have web socket things in here as well as you see you can send things from your web socket history or you can click on this web socket thingy here and then you can open a specific web socket request you can reconnect and then you can you can do whatever you want from here like for example i'm connecting right now there we go oh non web socket response returned that means that my connection is not open but this is useful if you want to play with web sockets a little bit there's also a useful inspector in here i can select these values and it's going to do things for me like for example if i select this jwt token it's going to say this is the selected text this is decoded from the url encoding uh, and i can do things with this uh, not particularly with the JWT token apparently, but I might be able to do it something with this. Like for example, I might be able to HTML and uh, decode it from HTML encoding, URL encoding, base64. I can see the query parameters in here. I can add specific ones. It's a uh, it's something that they added in later versions. Really useful, really cool. I would advise you guys again to play around with it a little bit. We can also go to the WebSocket history, of course, and send specifically to the repeater from there. We have to reconnect to our WebSocket, but it's going to say it's not open. Uh, that's because my website is not online, by the way. That's why it's returning this response. But if it would be open, I would be able to resend my socket message. So WebSocket's really, really cool. As you can see, you don't see the difference between a WebSocket tab and a normal tab. So what I would do is I would rename it and I would rename it with WS in front of it. And that way you always know that it's a WebSocket tab. Uh, very, very useful. Because if you have 50 tabs open, you really want to know which does which, of course. Now that's it for the repeater. Some basic stuff in there onto the sequencer. This is also really cool. What I can do here is I can select requests that have a JWT token in them. For example, I can go to my target tab in here. I'm going to quickly remove all of this stuff that I have in here. Okay, so there we go. I should have a specific request to log in, which is what I'm looking for right now. I'm just going to use this. So there we go. Let's search for the login functionality. This is not the one that I'm looking for. The API users request, there we go. So this is the one that I'm looking for. Um, if I send this to the repeater, I have a response in here. Uh, and this response is not the one that contains the JWT token, I see. But this one contains a deluxe token, for example. Now, if this token would be filled in, and I'd like to know the randomness of that token, that's what the sequencer is going to do for us. We can send this specific response to the sequencer, and then we can select the location of the token which we want to test for randomness, which would be in here. Now I've already prepared this one for you guys. As you can see in here, what I did was I, let's send this to the, can I send this to the repeater? No, apparently not. What I did was in here was just a basic call to log in. I got a JWT token back, as you can see from here, which I selected. So I just went like this. This is going to be where my JWT token is. And then it's going to say start the expression here and end the expression here. And it's always going to select my JWT token from there. Now, then what I can do is I can start my live capture. And this is the important part. This is going to take a long, long, long time. As you can see in my application, it's just erroring out. But if you want, you guys can check the PDF. And then there it's going to show you how it's working. It's going to 
do a lot of requests, analyze those tokens, and then you can look at how those tokens are uh, on a randomness distribution scale. Now it needs quite a lot of tokens, of course, because randomness distribution, it needs a lot of samples before you can actually say with confidence that the randomness is good or not. So it will run for quite a while. It actually needs a whole lot of samples. So make it run, then do some other things. Make sure that you're grabbing yourself a coffee, making yourself comfortable. This can take a whole while. Um, you can see that your number of threads in here can be adjusted. Don't make this too high because it can adversely change the performance of your application. If I send a thousand requests at a time, my server is simply not going to be able to handle those requests. No matter how good my server is, it's not going to be able to handle it. So I need to throttle my enthusiasm a little bit and I need to wait for my tokens. Then it's going to, of course, I can also manually load my tokens if I already have a lot. But you need to realize that you need to have a lot of tokens before you can actually make this work properly. There are some analysis options as well. You shouldn't mess with this too much. And if you want to know what the results mean, that's a whole topic in and of itself. So I would really advise you to look that up. Um, that's a different course. <laughs> We're going to look into that later. Then we move on to the decoder tab and this is one of the most useful tabs it has. Um, why? Because you don't have to keep switching windows and that again saves milliseconds. Milliseconds matter in my opinion. In this tab, say for example I find a base64 encoded value and I want to decode it. I'm not going to have to go back to a web browser or look for a base64 decoder. No, I can just do that in here. I have my decoder available. So what I can do is I have specific texts, like for example, test. If I want to encode this as a base64, I can just click encode as base64 and it's going to do that for me. Now you'll notice that my text has gotten a specific color. And that color will always be the color that is matching which specific algorithm I picked in here. If I want to binary do that, that's possible. If I want to encode it as ASCII hex, that's possible. I can select anything from this list and it's going to color my specific value. Now I can also encode it multiple times. Um, so I can encode it as a hexadecimal value again, oh, which is not going to do much of course. I can encode this as an ASCII value, then I can encode it as HTML, there we go, and then we can start decoding again. So we can start decoding as HTML, decode as ASCII hex, and then decode as base64, and we have our original text again. Now that is something that a real life translation thing like Google Translate cannot do. Try doing that, Do enter like a, a search query and then search for it. Uh, like, like for example, enter test or something in your language and then translate it into 20 languages and then translate it back to your language. Google Translate cannot do this, but Burp Suite Decoder can. So extremely useful tool in my opinion. Um, you can see that sometimes the text color changes, sometimes the background color changes. If the text color changes, that means it's encoded as. If the background color changes, it means it's a decoded as. So you'll notice that these colors match whatever's in here in this list. And you can also hash your values as well, of course. Now, one thing you do have to note is that for these hashing values, you can see that they go for a gradient. It's from light gray to dark gray and it's basically the heaviness of the encryption algorithm I think or something like that. But it's not color coded the same way. Now you can also smart decode of course, um, that's also possible. So we can smart decode in here. Uh, I haven't seen that work yet, I don't know how it works. So if anybody knows please let me know. That is not something that is very useful for me, I usually try to do it myself. Um, on the comparer side of things, we also have a couple of useful things in here. Say that we have a couple of requests, like this is perfect to show you guys. We have a lot of these socket requests and we want to know what's actually different between all of these different GET requests. What we can do then is we can right click those requests after selecting them and then we can send them to the comparer 
comparer. We can choose between the requests and the responses. So we can send them to the comparer and as you can see it creates a big list of items that we can compare and in here we can select one or multiple items like this for example I want to compare these to this and I want to, want to compare the word, uh, word based. Now if I select multiple items from here guys this is a multi-select list but it does not work that way. If you can see in the bottom window, this is showing me which samples I cannot select anymore. And I have a range selected in here of all of the other ones, but it's only showing me this one. So even though this is a multi-select, this is a bug. It's not supposed to be multi-select. It's supposed to be like this where you can only select one of them. Um, important to know because it's only going to compare the last one that you hovered your mouse over while you had it selected and then you can click the compare button here to compare the different words in there or you can compare the bytes even now that might be useful if you're doing byte uh, level fuzzing I don't do that as much but it is possible of course and then you can compare those bytes um, really useful tool that compare we also have our extender in which we have a lot of extensions that we can install a lot much more than a person will ever need in their lifetime and we can also manually install things so what else would you need right we can infinitely extend this there's going to be a separate uh, video on how the extension works I mean in the sense that there's going to be a separate course of course um, for the extender and in that we're going to teach you how to write your own extensions Basic Java knowledge is required Now for the other tabs in here you have some basic options which you can go through But in my opinion they are not very useful I hardly ever use them If I need a SOX proxy I will use it If I have an upstream proxy server I will use it But that's something that's more useful for pen testers I think I'm not going to set up a at home upstream proxy server at here. I don't know why that would be useful for me. Um, so that's basically the basics of Burp Suite. I hope you guys enjoyed. That's quite a lot of things that you can do. As you can see, Burp Suite is very, very in depth. It's not just some basic tool, it's super, super rich in features. It has a lot of things you can do. And besides that, I almost forgot we also have the burp collaborator and the burp intruder those are very very important um, things in here if you're testing for blind SSRF for example this can be really useful or for anything that requires an out-of-band server because what this basically is is an out-of-band server that's going to allow you to send requests to that web server and HTTP requests, DNS requests, uh, all of these different types of requests to your collaborator server. And if they come in, you can see that in here and you can actually examine the requests. So this is a very, very useful feature. And I haven't even gone over all of them yet because there are even more. You have your click uh, bandit, you have infiltrator, you have your configuration libraries, there are project options which you can set and your intruder you can configure it from here. Same thing for your repeater, you can configure it from here. You can detach any of these windows which might be useful, say for example if you want to put that on a separate location on your or even on a second monitor, it's all possible. You can detach any of those, you can reattach them, if you close them it's going to reappear in here simple as that so burp suite amazing tool i hope you guys enjoyed and i will see you on the next one bye amazing hackers